Once Jesus died on the cross, now his blood cleanses us from sins. The blood of the animals in the Old Testament covered their sins. It didn't cleanse it, it covered it. If you have a spot on your carpet and you invite somebody over for dinner, so you quick put a throw rug over it. Well, it's covered, but it's still there. The blood of the animals would only cover their sin, so they really couldn't go to heaven yet. They went to paradise, Abraham's bosom. Then, after Jesus died on the cross, he told Mary when he rose from the dead, hey, don't touch me, I haven't yet ascended to my father. Apparently, right then, he went up and brought his blood up, put it on the mercy seat in heaven, and now our sins are cleansed, because when he came back down and told Thomas what, the next day, hey, touch me, put your finger in the hand, put your finger in the hole of my hand. Hi, everyone. This is Jennifer Bagnashi with Deep Believer. Today, we have a return guest. And today, we are going to go over the beginning, how life was at the beginning. Were there dinosaurs? What was Neanderthals? What was life like for those in the beginning? And whether at the end, it will return to that. Kent Hoven, thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thank you. It's an honor to be here. All right. So we already established where you came from before, so we won't go over that, Kent. But let's talk about the beginning. Okay. okay. So I want to begin with the beginning of time. And we'll go over this really quickly. I know we just did a debate on it, but we'll start with this since it is the beginning. How old or young would you say the earth is and why? The earth is about six, the whole universe is about 6,000 years old. It is not billions of years old like they teach in the propaganda. It cannot be for lots of scientific reasons, which I cover on my video series, number one, about the age of the earth, how to show the earth cannot be billions of years old. Dinosaurs lived with Adam and Eve. If you look at my chart here, you'll see that the Bible says Adam was 130 when Seth was born. That's in Genesis chapter five. And then Seth was 105 when his son was born. And it gives the dates right there. It couldn't be spelled out clearly. Everybody before the flood is living over 900 years, almost everybody. Well, something was different back then before the flood came in the days of Noah. After the flood, you see on the right-hand side of the chart, after the flood, it drops off to 400 years, and then 200, and then 100. And today, hardly anybody makes it to 100. I'm going to do that or die trying. But uh, I think it was just something was different before the world, before the flood. And reptiles, which never stop growing, reptiles grow all their life. If they could live to be 900, they'd get 60 feet long. The dinosaurs were big lizards that lived with Adam and Eve. They did not live millions of years ago. So we cover all that on video number three about dinosaurs living with man. Always, they called them a different name because the word dinosaur wasn't made up until 1841. They called them dragons or some other name, behemoth or leviathan in the Bible. And so, <clears throat> but what made man live to be 900? It's been a fascinating study of mine for years and other people about why did they live to be 900 and why don't we today? So to answer your question, the original creation was perfect. God looked at it when he was done on day seven and said, it's very good. Nothing was going wrong. Satan had not fallen from heaven yet. Satan was in the garden of Eden until he fell. It tells us in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. So it was a perfect world. Man, well, actually the woman <clears throat> messed it up. <clears throat> Stop it, Ken. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So how long do you think that Lucifer or Satan was in the garden before the fall? Well, the only dates we really have to put our teeth into is Adam was 130 when Seth was born. Now, Seth uh, was, they were outside the garden when that happened. They'd already sinned and got kicked out. Before that, they had Cain and Abel, but no dates are given. So let's just do some guessing here. How old were Cain and Abel when they got old enough to get in a fight and kill each other? Maybe in their 30s or 20s. Okay. So let's say Adam could have been in the garden for 100 years. Had everything perfect. Satan up in heaven and coming back and forth to earth was seeing them fellowship with God saying, boy, they, they should be worshiping me. I'm strong. I'm handsome. I'm beautiful. I'm rich. It tells all the reasons he, he fell from heaven, his beauty, his riches, his wisdom in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. So Lucifer got jealous, and he, he decided he wanted to take over God's kingdom. And so he came down and told Eve, if you do what I say, honey, you can be like God, knowing good and evil. You get to know everything, which I think is what AI is headed for right now. <clears throat> Another long story, okay? You get to know everything. I mean, right now I can tell you what the weather is in China. You couldn't do that 50 years ago or 100 years ago. 
right? Can't I just hit a button and tell you what the weather's going to be in China right now? So I think the knowledge is greatly increased, not the wisdom, but the knowledge. And there's a big difference between knowledge and wisdom. Do you know the difference? I do. Yeah. See, knowledge is knowing how to pick your nose. Wisdom is knowing when and where. Okay. <laughs> I taught high school 15 years. Okay. It messed up my brain. Right. <laughs> my guess would be they were in the garden for a hundred years. They, Satan fell from heaven, tricked Eve. She said, Adam, here, eat this. He said, oh, brother, I got I to gotta eat this to save you. He deliberately became sin to save his bride. Like Jesus deliberately let our sins be put on him to save us. So it's a great, great picture there. So the, my, to answer your question, my guess would be 100 years in the garden, everything perfect. All the animals were friendly. Everything was vegetarian. Everything. It was. We're going to get to that, too, because okay. that's really important, too. OK, so you mentioned, too, but at the very beginning, how the universe is 6,000, because you'll hear some people say, oh, maybe man is just 6,000. So how would you argue that the universe is 6,000 as opposed to just being the life of man? Well, in the Ten Commandments, God wrote on a rock with his finger. I want you to honor the Sabbath for in six days. The Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is. He made the heaven and the earth in six days, everything, stars included. Actually, it didn't make the stars till day four. Made the earth first, then the stars. And then it says 17 times in the Bible, God stretched out the heavens. You know, we know that when an when a, a object is producing light and it's receding from us, leaving us, it, it gives what's called a red shift. It's a long, complicated thing, but in astronomy... When they look at a star and they look through a telescope, they say, wow, there's, it's redshifted, indicating the star is moving away from us. It's what they call the Doppler effect. With sound, you can hear it clearly when you're sitting at a train track and the train's coming in. As it comes toward you, it presses the sound wave together. When it leaves, it refracts them or stretches them. So you hear a sound difference as it goes by. Whether you're going by the train or the train's going by you, you get the same effect. Well, if, if a star is leaving us, receding, It'll give this red shift because the Doppler effect of light. And they look around the universe and say, wow, all the stars seem to be leaving. That proves a big bang. No, that proves the Bible's true. 17 times he said he stretched out the heavens. See, he made the earth first. Then he made the stars and stretched them out. He made the sun after the earth. I think God purposely did all this so we would know, don't worship the sun, don't worship the stars. You got to have them. They're pretty cool. We need them. Thank you. But don't, don't worship them, you know. And so, but people, they did anyway, all through history, worship the stars and the zodiac symbols and all that stuff. So, yeah, I think uh, it's clear from the Bible that God made the earth first. Then he made, he made everything. He said it in Exodus 20. He said it again in Exodus 31. Jesus said the creation of Adam and Eve was the beginning. Matthew 19, 4, Mark 10, 6. Well, that's, that's clear enough. If that wasn't the beginning, then Jesus was lying. And he wasn't lying. Okay, now how about the earth? Because now there are people who are believing and sharing online that the earth is actually not moving because the Bible says the earth cannot be moved. So they don't believe that the earth is spinning. Hmm. What do you say about that? I can go out my yard, get a shovel full of dirt, pick it up, and throw it. Is the earth moving? That part is. That goes with the flat earthers. I say, come touch it. We got an ant mound, an ant pile. That proves it's not flat. Just that ant pile, it's not flat. The earth is definitely spinning and it is going around the sun and that doesn't contradict any scriptures. It's, it's a perspective thing. All of the observers are on this planet. Okay. If you're, uh, you and your husband and my wife and I are going for a ride in the car and you're in the back seat and you say, Hey, brother Hovind, would you hand me back a Coke? So we're going 70 miles an hour North. I pick up the Coke and hand it back to you 20 miles an hour. Did the Coke go forward or backward? Backward. If to us in the car, it went backward. To somebody on the street, it went forward. I, I reduced it from 70 miles an hour to 50 miles an hour to get it. So it's all a matter of who's talking and who's watching. So is the earth stationary? Well, to us on, on standard here, yeah. But if you're, out, if, if, you're, if you're out in space looking at it, you'd say, no, it's turning. Well, nobody's out in space looking at it. So it's, hand me back the Coke. You would not say, Brother Hovind, would you please decelerate that Coke to 50 miles an hour so I can get it? No, just hand me back the coat. Okay. So what about the firmament? Do you believe that the firmament is still there? Like in Genesis, how the Lord provided Absolutely. a firmament. Okay. So you do. Well, yeah, the Bible says the birds fly in the firmament. That's in Genesis chapter one. So the firmament is the air we're breathing, but it said in Genesis chapter one, 
there was going to be water above the firmament. Now that is gone. If you look at, read the Bible carefully, if you watch my video number one, I describe all this in great detail with lots of pictures. But God made the, in the beginning, in Genesis 1, if you have the right Bible, Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven, singular. Check your Bible. If it says heavens, plural, throw that Bible away. Get a King James. It's heaven, singular. Now, later, he began to divide the heaven up into three slices. First heaven, second heaven, third heaven. The third heaven is where Paul went when he was stoned to death or rocked to sleep outside the city of Lystra. He went up to the third heaven. There's only one mention of it in the Bible. I believe the Bible indicates God made the earth and the heaven. Then he divided that into three slices. The first heaven where the birds fly, we call our atmosphere. Then there was ice above that, like a little greenhouse or a snow globe kind of thing, you know, a crystalline canopy surrounding the earth. I'm going to wildly pick a number and say 10 miles up. Right now, the air around the earth stretches out about 50 miles. If you squeezed it down to 10 miles and covered it with a couple inch layer of ice, the air pressure would be double and breathing would be easy. I don't know if you ever climbed a tall mountain, like when I climbed Pikes Peak, man, you get up there, can hardly breathe. Okay. When I climb Mount Rainier, it's like when you climb Mount Everest, you got to bring oxygen with you. That's only five miles up. Five miles. Air is about 50 miles thick. For the space shuttle and those things that have to, have to get outside the air, they got to be at least 50 or 70, whatever it is, miles above the Earth to get rid of the air friction or else it slow them down. So anyway, if you compressed all the air into, say, 10 miles, put a crystalline canopy, a couple inch thick layer of ice around everything. Then you got a second heaven, what we call outer space. That's where the stars are. Nobody knows where that ends. But apparently beyond that, it says God sits upon the uh, heavens. He sits upon many waters. I cover all this in video number two of my series. The, apparently there's another layer of ice way out there past the last star. If they could find the last star, nobody knows where it is. But if they could find it, what would the next obvious question be? <clears throat> what, what's after that? <laughs> okay. So maybe everything we see is in, in the, maybe this whole universe is a little snow globe on God's desk. He picks it up and shakes it once in a while. How are you doing in there? You know, shape up, knock it off. Uh, so, and then there's a third heaven of, about which we know very little other than the Bible gives a few clues. We know Paul apparently would, went there, came back after they stoned him to death, rose from the dead. And for the rest of his life, he was anxious to die. He told one of the churches, I've got a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to stay in the flesh is more needful for you. I'll stay here because you need me, but I'd much rather die. He'd go to town preaching, and they'd say, Paul, if you keep that preaching up, we're going to kill you. Bring it on, man. Go. He was ready to go. So that's the third heaven. Uh, so I think the firmament is not the canopy above. It's actually the air, which we still have. I'm breathing it right now. Okay, so we're going to go back to that in a minute because I just want to move on a little bit to going back i'll move on to going back how would the universe and the earth look if the earth was really millions or billions of years old how would the oceans look um the moon how would life be if it were a million or billions of years old well there are lots of things that we see are wearing out i mean probably everything is wearing out i'm wearing out you know uh so i think that the whole universe is, is wearing out the earth is spinning right now but it's slowing down how it slows down a thousandth of a second every day. And we know why it slows down. The tide banging up into the beach is a braking action. The Coriolis effect of the wind, the lunar drag, the internal friction uh, under, under the mantle with the liquid core, the spin. It's, it's, there's braking things. They're slowing it. The earth, the earth is slowing down. Google leap second. They have to have a leap second about every three years now because the earth is slowing down. They have to add a second to the clock to keep it, keep it li lined up right. So if the earth were billions of years old, I think it would have stopped spinning by now. We see the moon is getting farther away from the earth. The moon is leaving us about an inch and a half a year. There's a model of the moon and a model of the earth back here. Oh, I don't think anybody argues about this. The moon is leaving the earth about an inch and a half a year. Now it goes around in kind of an egg shape. It's not quite an exact circle, but close enough, okay? So the moon is going for inch and a half further away every year. Well, that would mean it used to be closer. How far back in time could you do before that becomes a problem? They've done all the math on this and say 1.2 billion years, the earth moon system would collapse because gravity becomes stronger the closer you get, like two magnets, you get them too close and they snap together. So the earth, moon, the moon would be, if it were billions of years old, the moon would be gone, long gone. 
And the moon is essential for life on Earth because that causes the tides, which keeps the oceans all stirred up. Everything would be stagnant if it weren't for the moon stirring up the tides. So I think that uh, the Earth's slowing down. The sun is burning an enormous amount of fuel, like four or five million tons per second. I think maybe the sun would be burned out. Certainly, it would not be this nice perfect orbit where the Earth is just the right distance from the sun. Not too hot, not too cold. The Goldilocks zone, you know, they call it. Venus is too close. It's way too hot. Mercury's too far. It's way too cold. Earth is in just the right spot. To say that that has been staying in just the right spot for billions of years while the while the uh, sun is burning up its fuel, losing its gravitational pull because of that, I think that's ludicrous. If somebody wants to believe the Earth is billions of years old, you can believe whatever you want, but the science would be dead against that. As it rains, the water runs off the soil into the ocean. Eventually, it all ends up in the ocean. Well, it brings with it mineral salts. The oceans are getting saltier every day. The sun takes out the water, just the evaporation takes the water only, leaves the minerals behind. Today, the oceans are 3.6% salt. They could have gone from totally fresh water 4,500 years ago, when Noah's flood was, to what they are today in 4,500 years. If the earth were billions of years old, the oceans would be much saltier like the Dead Sea or the salt in the Great Salt Lake. Nothing could live there. So I think it's ludicrous to say the earth is billions of years old. When we see the salt increasing, the continents are eroding flat, uh, eroding down. Uh, the moon is leaving us. The population of the earth is growing. You know, at the time of Jesus Christ, there was only one quarter of a billion people. 2,000 years ago, there were 250 million people. We've got more than that just in the U.S. Today, there's 8 billion people. I do on my video number one, different ways to prove the earth cannot be old. One of them, I show population growth chart. It looks clearly like the whole thing, the whole population started about 4,500 years ago when eight people got off of Noah's Ark. So how many people would you say was before Noah? Was it heavily populated? Was it, I mean, how did life well, look? What do you think? Here's the only clues we have to try to answer that. The Bible says God formed the earth to be inhabited. Today, 3% is habitable. 70% is underwater. 10% is under ice caps, 10% under deserts, a whole bunch of mountain ranges it's impossible to live on. They say about 3% of the earth is habitable. If God built it to be inhabited, suppose the whole earth was one even temperature because it wasn't tilted. And as it spins, it went around the sun perpendicular to the equator. Everybody gets 12 hours daylight, 12 hours of darkness, equinox. And suppose this canopy kept even temperature everywhere. And suppose the whole world was growing vegetation. I mean, they find uh, redwood trees frozen up at the north, near the North Pole. If the whole earth was habitable before the flood, and I believe it was, you got even temperature, you got food growing like crazy, and you run around naked in the Garden of Eden all day, they'd have a baby every nine months and 20 minutes. And I think there were a bunch of people, a whole, whole bunch of people on the earth. <clears throat> Adam lived to be 900 years old. How many kids could you have in 900 years? A whole bunch. I would guess a whole lot more people on the earth before the flood than there are now. And they and all the animals too, or lots of animals, they all got squished into oil, which is why we're running our cars today. Okay. So you mentioned too, how there was, you know, how there's a lot of, um, or there's 3% populated on the earth. And then you have what's under the water and you have all that. Now, do you believe that there was more land before the flood? Oh yeah. Mostly land. Okay. The earth was designed to be inhabited. The, the water used to be under the crust of the earth. Uh, the Bible says he founded the earth upon the seas and established it upon the floods. I've got pictures of that here somewhere. Oh, here we go. This will work if you call my pictures up. Slide number 735, Alt DV. I have about 7,000, I mean, 50,000 slides I use in my presentation. I'm a visual learner. I taught high school 15 years. Okay. There used to be a layer of water or ice, probably two or three. The Jews have always taught it was two or three fingers thick. How they know that, I don't know. Maybe God told Adam, you know, he passed it on and Noah passed it on. I don't know. Then there was a layer of air about 10 miles, <clears throat> I'm guessing. Then a layer of dirt and rocks to stand on the crust of the earth, again, about 10 miles thick. Under that was a huge amount of water. That's where the flood water came from. The fountains of the deep broke open. Most of the water came from inside the earth. And if the water inside shot up, if the earth cracked up like an egg, like an eggshell, and it still is cracked up today, you know, the fault lines all over the place. 
I think that's where the water came shooting out. If the water comes shooting out to the top, well, the crust is going to sink in as the water escapes. Rock is heavier than water. And so if the, the mass, the, the weight or the mass of the earth shrank in a few miles, that would speed it up just a little tiny bit. Maybe that's why we have 365.2422 days in a year. Maybe it used to be 365. All the ancient calendars have 365. What about that extra time? Well, I think the earth sped up a little tiny bit because of the contraction of the mass with a, a rock sinking into the void. It used to be the earth was totally covered in water and Noah's flood. And in Psalm 104, it says, toward the end of the flood, the mountains arose, the valleys sank down, and the water rushed off. So I think the mountain ranges formed near the end of the flood. The water from the flood is still here. There's enough water out there in the oceans right now to cover the earth a mile and a half deep. Everywhere. One atheist said, if there was a really a flood, where'd all that water go? It's still here. It's in the oceans. I flew over to Pacific one time, and I came back and told the guys in my office, I said, man, that Pacific Ocean's huge. They said, oh, that's just the top of it. There's a whole lot of water out there. Okay. So, yeah, I think the flood, uh, Noah's flood really happened. It says in 2 Peter, at the end of time, there's going to be scoffers, 2 Peter 3, who are willingly ignorant. That means dumb on purpose of how God made the world. They don't understand how God made it under a canopy of ice, water under the crust. They don't understand that. And they're ignorant of how the world was overflowed with water and perished. And they're ignorant of the coming judgment of God. We find fossils of everything, almost everything, that is much bigger. They find fossil rabbits that were huge. Fossil rabbits, gigantic. Fossil lizards, 60 feet long. We call them dinosaurs. Fossil turtles, 15 feet. Fossil kangaroos, a 14-foot tall kangaroo fossil. Fossil sharks that were enormous. I think everything was bigger. Everything bigger before the flood. They find 50 to 60 foot sharks. Fossil kangaroo, 10 feet tall. I just think it was just a different world because of that air pressurized air, perfect diet, perfect soil to grow everything. All that got destroyed at the flood. But they find fossils of everything that are just ginormous by today's standards. Uh, modern cows were much bigger. Let's see, a species of ancient giant rhinoceros, uh, 21 ton. Of course, they say it's millions of years ago. No, it's not. This is before the flood came. 18 foot tall rhinoceros, University Museum. Uh, let's see, a giant bird, 7.5 meter. What's that? 20, uh, about 23 foot, 23 foot wingspan. That thing couldn't fly in today's air. The air is too thin. Couldn't flap fast enough. But if you had compressed air, everything bigger can fly. They find fossil grasshoppers two feet long. They couldn't breathe today. They breathe through their skin. So anyway, you cover all that in video number two of my series. You get the whole series for 50 bucks. Uh, I, Jennifer, when I started this ministry 35 years ago, I made videotapes. Now it's DVDs. We used to loan them out. I learned right away, Christians don't steal, but they borrow and never return. So you buy it for 50 bucks. When you're done, you can copy it. Then give it back, get your money back. But I'm not going to loan it to you, Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, Ken. So would you say Adam and Eve were larger as well? Since you said everything else was larger, were they larger as well? That would be a guess on anybody's part, but I, I would give it almost certainly yes. They find fossil skeletons 15 feet tall. I think people were probably much bigger. I think if Adam and Eve came back today and looked at us, say, what happened? You forgot to eat your breakfast, huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was just a different world. Uh -huh. If you had perfect air, and you're under compression and 35% oxygen instead of 21. We have plenty of evidence the earth used to have greater oxygen. And you're 15 or 18 feet tall. You don't need a car. You can run to grandma's. Only they didn't have a grandma. But you can go anywhere you want. Okay, It's a very different world. Giant alligator, 20 foot. I think uh, if, you look, if you're willing to look at the, uh, the evidence scientifically, you'll say something was different on this planet. Things were much, much bigger. Everything. Fossil clams. You know, the biggest oyster today is in a restaurant in Denmark. Guinness Book of World Records has it listed. The world's biggest oyster, 14 inches. Well, they find fossil oysters 11 feet, two miles above sea level. I think maybe something was different before the flood came. There's a fossil tree. Let's see, fossil trees, 237 feet long. Well, I don't have a problem with that. Fossil rats, what's the world's biggest? 60 kinds of rats in the world. 60 kinds of rats, typically five inches long. They find fossil rats, let's see, that are uh, two and a half feet. 
That's a big rat. So I, I collect all this kind of stuff on my video series about just the world was different, very different. And that's all changed now because of that flood and the canopy. If the canopy collapsed during the flood and the air then expanded out to 50 miles, that would cool the earth down at the same time as other factors heating the earth up. So it kind of balanced out. Okay, so where do they get the numbers to say that the earth is millions of billions of years old? Where do the numbers come from? Well, if you eat pizza with peanut butter on it before you go to bed, you will dream up stupid stuff like that. That's probably what they did. So they just wing it. They just say, they guess. Basically, it's guesswork. Yeah. On their end. I have a whole, I'm in the middle of my library here at our church, at Genesis Baptist Church in Lenox, Alabama. I've got science books from earth science, biology, physical science, the three subjects I taught, going back to the 1800s. You can look up the age of the earth. It varies wildly. Just 30 years ago, I think it was 30, I get to get my book. They were teaching the earth is 18 billion years old. Then it went down to 13.7. What happened to the 7 billion years, guys? You're just going to throw it away? I mean, they changed the number at will. They're going to say they do this by carbon dating or potassium argon or iridium strontium or lead 208 or lead 206. That's all baloney, okay? Video number seven, we cover a long explanation of how carbon dating does not work and why. They have, you can take a living piece of t- a tissue off of a living animal. They've done this. Take a snail crawling around in the laboratory, break a piece off the shell, carbon date it. It'll come back thousands of years old. And it's still, it's living in your laboratory. So it's just, it does not work. I cover that uh, video number seven. I'll debate anybody on that. Okay. Okay. So if the earth was billions of millions of years old, would we be walking on the ocean? If the, if the mountains are melting down, eroding into the sea, and they are, the mountains get shorter, the seas fill in with mud. Eventually, it would be one big muddy, muddy slush pile. Now, you mentioned the 1800s. There's another theory going around. I don't know if you heard of it, where people now believe that dinosaurs didn't really exist because the first that they actually heard of dinosaurs was the 1800s. And they believe that it was, it's a fluke. What do you say about that? Well, I think that's crazy. The 1800s is when they began developing power equipment where you can dig a lot more dirt than when you can with a shovel. So there began to, began to be a lot more excavation with steam powered, you know, steam shovels and stuff, and eventually diesel and gasoline powered stuff like we have today. So that was the industrial revolution when they started needing more, more stuff out of the ground, needing more coal. So they started doing a lot more mining with a lot bigger equipment in the 1800s. And that's when they began finding a lot more stuff uh, in the ground. So uh, the, the coal that we find in the ground, there's one coal seam in Montana that's uh, 250 feet thick, pure coal. That's a lot of coal. In the coal, sometimes they find human artifacts. We'll be covering that tonight on my show about oop art, out of place artifacts, if you want to tune in. Genesis Baptist Church on YouTube at 7 p.m. Central. But we're going to, uh, our, our, we're on 10 channels. They're all listed on drdino.com, our website, D R D I N O. So I think. They began in the 1800s, they began finding a lot more bones because they're doing a lot more digging. It's a lot easier to dig. They knew about them before that. Okay. They've always known about these giant reptile bones found in the dirt and they had different names for them. So in 1841, some guy named Richard Owen in in, uh, England made up a brand new word, dinosaur, which means terrible lizard. These are giant bones of a giant lizard. So he called them a dinosaur, which means terrible lizard. That's all. They just changed the name. Before that, people called them dragons. Same animal, different name. So what's the earliest year or the earliest discovery for the fossils of a dinosaur, of dinosaurs? They they probably began finding dead dinosaur bones right after the flood. All kinds of animals would be laying on top. Probably the stink was pretty bad. But if they get buried, then they have a chance of fossilizing. Something can turn to a fossil in in a couple of hours, a couple, a couple, what, 24 hours, you said? In the lab, under pressure and heat, they can fossilize something in 24 hours. Let's pick a number and say it takes two to three years under natural conditions for bone. I mean, if you bury people today, or like uh, there's an avalanche, buries a whole forest full of animals, then they might fossilize over the next couple of years. If you dig them up, they'll be turned into stone, like this petrified clam. This is a clam petrified in the closed position, indicating it was buried rapidly because it's closed. 
clams open when they die right away. That's why you hardly ever find a match pair of seashells when you go along the beach. You find one here, another one someplace else, they don't match. Uh, so petrified closed clams indicate rapid burial like Noah's flood would do. I don't know when they found the first dinosaur bones, but they probably would have made up legends about dragons or, uh, you know, the Chinese have lots of legends going way back 4,000 years about dragons. Many ancient countries with ancient roots like uh, Iraq, uh, China, India, they all talk about dragons or some, some animal similar to that. They even have artwork of them, pictures drawn of humans living with them. Of course, today, our modern scientists are convinced dinosaurs lived millions of years ago because they've been brainwashed by the stupid geologic column. It does not exist anywhere. I can't believe. They tell the kids, the layers of the earth are different ages. I say, really? If that top layer is younger, tell me, where's it, where's it coming from? Is it coming from outer space? How can the layers be different ages? It is just not common sense. They, they teach us like it's just a fact of science. Oh, it's not a fact of science. That geologic column was made up. I cover that on video number uh, four about the geologic column. There is no geologic column. It doesn't exist anywhere in the world. All the layers of the earth are the same age. I'll show you. All over the world, we find hundreds, actually maybe even thousands of petrified trees that are standing up. Here you got a picture right here. Petrified tree standing up, connecting all the layers. Now, Jennifer, how long does the dead tree stand around in Colorado before it falls over? I don't know. A couple of years, not millions. Okay, of course, yeah. Okay, well, petrified trees in the standing position are found all over the world, running through all these layers. And they're telling us these layers are different ages by millions of years. I'm sorry, I don't believe that for one second. When a petrified tree is connecting all the layers, I think all the layers had to form in one year. Noah's flood would do that just with the tide going up and down as, as the earth spins under the moon. That would make a tidal a pumping action, pumping water in and out of the high tide. That would cause all the layers to form in one year around these petrified standing trees. So video number two gives a whole lot more on that petrified standing trees. I'm sorry. The earth, the geologic column does not exist. They need to get a new theory. All right. Now let's talk about Neanderthals. Hmm. Were they real? If so, what were they? And if not, why do people say that they were Neanderthals? Well, the, a, guy, a guy named Joachim Neander loved the Lord, used to wander around in Germany in this valley and sing songs. Praise to the Lord, the almighty, the king of creation. He made that song up back in the 1600s. When he died, they named the valley after him, Joke, the Neander Valley. Many years later, somebody found some bones in there of a human. They weren't Joachim's skeleton, but they found petrified bones of a human. And they said, wow, th they called it Neanderthal man because it came out of the Neander Valley. So the Neanderthals were just normal humans. Their eyebrow ridges were thicker and the back of their head was elongated. The Bible says Eve's the mother of all living. And nothing died until Adam sinned. The Bible is very clear. Nothing died till Adam sinned. So we're made in God's image. So what about the, is God a chimpanzee or an ape? What about these cavemen? You know, is this grandpa? Textbooks say it is. So here, let me get this up to the Neanderthals. Okay, this is all on video number three. They have these family trees, these charts of the Homo sapien, Homo erectus, all this stuff. It's all baloney. We got a collection of skulls in our museum here. They claim this is, uh, you know, proof of evolution, lining up the skulls. Uh, the daddy of us all, this paper says. You don't know he's the daddy of anybody. When you find bones in the dirt, you couldn't prove it had any children. Could you? All yeah. you know is it died. Yeah. You, okay. The mother of all mammals. You don't know that. If you find a fossil in the dirt, all you could prove in a court of law is it died. You could not prove it had any children. You could not prove it had children that were different. And you certainly couldn't prove it had kids that lived. It's all imagination. So we cover all this on videos. So they claim bones in the dirt can do something that no animal today can do. No animal today can produce a baby that other than the same kind. Or one of our cows just had a, I knew it was going to, when it was pregnant, I said, I'll get you five bucks. It's going to have a calf. And it did. Okay. They always do. Every farmer in the world will tell you cows produce cows and corn produces corn. There's no exceptions. But they want to say a bone in the dirt could do something that no animal today could do. That's stupid. So anyway, I've got Neanderthals in here somewhere. Here's what they really found. Before the flood came, the people lived to be 900 years old. Well, when you chew, the muscles of your face have to work, the masseter muscle, the, even the frontalis muscle. The uh, muscles of your face are constantly flexing and relaxing, and they're pulling on the bone. 
and actually makes you have thicker bone. A, a, a weightlifter will tell you, a bodybuilder will tell you, you not only build the muscles, you build the bone. Bone gets thicker when you work out. So when they find Neanderthals found in the Neander Valley, Neanderthal, the only thing unusual about them, average height was five foot eight, just like it is today. And the Neanderthals, uh, let's see, they claim they lived th thousands of years ago. No, it's not. Let's see, I'll show you Neanderthal. Before the flood, they lived to be 900. After the flood, they still lived to be 400 for a while. I think there's the answer. Then it dropped off to 200, then 100. The more you chew, the more your brow ridge grows. Eyebrow ridge grows bigger. When, when a person ages, just that, just that alone will make their eyebrow ridge get bigger. So the Neanderthals had bigger brow ridge. So that doesn't mean they're half ape. It means they're living longer. They're David Harbour movie star. Is he a Neanderthal? Got a big brow ridge. Plus the bump on the back of the skull called the occipital bun. Well, the muscles at the back of your neck, when you head, bend your head down and lift your head back up, they got to pull on your head. And so that slowly elongates the bone of your head. It's just a sign of old age. That's all. Small, the bone senses small changes and can grow dramatically. Hmm. When you start exercising, Near the joints, the bones get bigger and more dense. Wow. So bigger eyebrow ridge and longer head does not mean it's half ape. It means it's a 400-year-old man. That's all. So what about cavemen? Would you consider that to be equivalent to cavemen? Well, there's people today living in caves. Osama bin Laden was a caveman for a while until they found him, wasn't he? So what does that prove? I, I could go live in a cave if I want. I don't want to. Uh, so... I think that's, that's all that means. I think right after the flood, when they got off the ark and started spreading out, it's natural when you go to some area to live, it, it, you take over an island, Tom Hanks, you know, cast away, look for a cave. It's going to take you a while to build a house. Meanwhile, you want a place to sleep at night, not get rained on, and you want to you spend your time hunting to get some food. Then after the next few, over the next few months, you build yourself a straw hut. But it'd be normal to move to an area and, and live in a cave. I think it's just... Uh, It'd be normal to, when, as people spread out from Noah's flood, move to an area. If you have to, for the first few months, live in a cave until you can build yourself a house. Okay. So you mentioned something earlier, and I said we get back to it, and we're getting back to it. You said how the earth was different. The soil was different, and people were vegetarians back then. So what happened? Because we didn't eat meat, and did we have canines back then like we do now to rip apart meat? Well, the canine teeth are perfect for chewing tough vegetables as well. The panda bear, panda bear has big sharp teeth and he lives on vegetables. So it's not, it, you know, sharp teeth is not indication of meat eater. Um, the, uh, before the flood, the Bible says in Genesis chapter one, God said, Adam, I want you and Eve to eat the fruit, the vegetables and the seeds. We don't do that much. We eat the fruit, throw away the seed, which is one of the most important vitamins in the world is in that seed. You should eat the seed. After the flood, God told Noah in Genesis chapter nine, now Noah, you can eat meat and the animals are going to be afraid of you. So up until that, for the first 1600 years of world history, everything was eating plants. He told the animals, he told, God said to Adam in the garden, all the animals are going to eat fruit. I'm going to eat vegetable, fruit, and, fruit and vegetables. Genesis chapter one, every beast of the earth, oh, upside down. Every beast of the earth will eat vegetation it's in chapter one. So it wasn't until after the flood in chapter nine, when they got out, there you go. God said, verse 29, Genesis one, I've given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in the, which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed to you. It shall be for meat and to every beast of the earth and to every fowl of the air and to everything that creepeth upon the earth. Where there is life, I've given every green herb for meat. All the animals ate plants until after the flood. So what happened? I mean, was it the soil? Was it the nutrients was no longer there that we oh, had no. to eat meat? It could be the air pressure was less. They need more nutrients out of the, I don't know. Watch the video when we get to heaven. It'll probably be a DVD, not a video, but uh, when we get to heaven. So now when people died, uh, you know, in the beginning of time. And, you know, even in the Old Testament, we know that Jesus had not been born yet, even though we know Jesus is God. He always existed. He's always been here. But where did people go when they died? And how did they get there as opposed to Hades? 
Well, we know that man is a triune being, a body, soul, and spirit. You live in your body. You could cut your arm off and throw it away and burn it up, and you're still you, okay? You can cut both your arms off. You can cut both your arms and legs off. Actually, you can cut your whole body off and still be you. There's something about you that's not just the physical. There's a spirit and a soul. So the Bible says before the flood came, all the indications are that people, when they died and they trusted the Lord, they did what was right, they brought their sacrifice, like God told them, and they went to paradise. Jesus told the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. Jesus and Luke uh, chapter 16 tells the story about the rich man and Lazarus. They died. They both went to the center of the earth where one was tormented and one was in paradise. They could see each other and talk to each other with a great gulf in between them. See, that was all pre-crucifixion. Once Jesus died on the cross, now his blood cleanses us from sins. The blood of the animals in the Old Testament covered their sins. It didn't cleanse it. It covered it. If you have a spot on your carpet and you invite somebody over for dinner, so you quick put a throw rug over it. Well, it's covered, but it's still there. The blood of the animals would only cover their sin. So they really couldn't go to heaven yet. They went to paradise, Abraham's bosom. Then after Jesus died on the cross, he told Mary when he rose from the dead, hey, don't touch me. I haven't yet ascended to my father. Apparently right then he went up and brought his blood up, put it on the mercy seat in heaven. And now our sins are cleansed. Because when he came back down and told Thomas, what the next day, hey, touch me, put your finger in the hand, put your finger in the hole of my hand. Okay. So now our sins are cleansed. And Paul said to be absent from the bodies to be present with the Lord. So from now, from the crucifixion on, the resurrection actually on, if you die, you go straight to heaven to be absent from the bodies to be present with the Lord. But before that, Old Testament saints, they had to wait. It says in Ephesians that Jesus, when he died, he led captivity captive. I think that means he went down to hell, presented the gospel. Hey guys, y'all been waiting here. I'm, I, I died. I rose from the dead. My blood, you get to go to heaven now. Your sins are cleansed. Come with me. So he took those on the paradise side with him to heaven. That's the best I can do with the scriptures on all, all the different scriptures that, about this topic. That See, there's only two religions, Cain and Abel. Cain brought his fruit and vegetables. Hey, God, look what I did for you. God wouldn't take it. Abel brought a lamb. God said, I'll take it. Bringing your good work, saying, God, you should take me into heaven. Look how good I am. That's never going to get you there. If you don't have the blood of Jesus Christ, in the Old Testament, they had to have the blood of their sacrifice, their your yearly, you know, a lamb or a bullock or something once a year. Um, they had to have that sacrifice to, to cover their sins. They'd say, Lord, I followed your word. I followed all the laws. I did my best. I brought the sacrifice. God say, good. You wait right there in paradise till I die on the cross for you. Then I'll take you all to heaven. So, Yes. There is a difference. That's where the Catholics get the crazy idea of purgatory. There is no purgatory. You don't go burn off your sins, okay? Today, you go straight to heaven. Okay, so what were the conditions back then? In order to get to Abraham's bosom, what were the conditions? It's always been the same, by faith. By faith in anyone by, or just... Well, by faith in by you, God told him, bring a sacrifice. You don't have to understand why, just do what I said. Abel, God told Adam and Eve when they sinned, they made fig leaf aprons. God said, no, something has to die. He made coats of skins. By the way, their idea of modesty was a fig leaf, and God's idea was a coat. I think that's a sermon in there someplace, okay? But exactly what modesty is. My daddy would say to the girls, if you're not in business, don't advertise, okay? But uh, <clears throat> so <clears throat> now, that, but it had to be a d death of an animal. So they would have the death. You can read all through the Old Testament laws. You know, if you if for this sin, you got to bring a lamb or a bullock, you know? And they had all their rules. They would kill it. The blood would be put on the altar for your sin. Then they would cook the meat and the priest would get part of it. And uh, some would be burned up. There's different kinds of sacrifices through the Old Testament. Some, they just burned it up, a whole burnt offering. Sometimes they would cook it and the priest gets to keep the right shoulder and uh, all this kind of stuff. But that's all gone now. That's all done with Jesus Christ on the cross. So they had faith. God, I brought my sacrifice. I, I, have, I, have, I'm, I have faith that this sacrifice is going to hold off your judgment on me until you can provide the right sacrifice. It all points toward Jesus. The, the ones that were scholars reading, they knew that someday the Messiah is going to come and he's going to set us free. They knew somebody's coming and the prophets kept preaching it over and over and over again, but they didn't, they, most people, a lot of people didn't hear it, didn't understand it. But yeah, my sins are gone. Praise God. 
Amen. Okay, so where did other religions come from? Because it seems like there was a time period where other gods and other religions weren't even mentioned until a certain time afterward in Genesis. So where did they come from? Well, Satan started right at the very beginning. It started with him. He wants to be God. He wants God's job. You see that in Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, Lucifer wanted to be God. He said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. He wanted God's job. He got kicked out of heaven, came down to earth and said, Eve, if you do what I say, you can be like God. Read Genesis 3. Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. That's part of the lie he told her. And all through history, there have been religions that have tried to teach, if you do this and this and this and this, you get to go to heaven or you get to be God. Many, it's a de deifying mankind. And it's so sad that people fall for that dumb idea. If I was the devil, I would start a whole bunch of religions just to confuse people. Where's the truth? The truth is very plain. God keeps it right here. So it's been preserved all through history. You can read it and find out for yourself. But the devil has started all these crazy religions. It really goes back, to the, again, to the Cain and Abel. Do you go to heaven because of what you do? Is it your works? This is what so many churches, they teach. If you get baptized by one of our preachers, you get to go to your sins are gone because of that water in the tub. Hold it, you just baptized Jimmy a few minutes ago, and now you're going to baptize me in that same water. So his sins are going to get stuck on me now, huh? Yeah, I don't want his sins. I'll keep my own. So the, the idea that baptism saves you is ridiculous. That's part of the Cain religion, the Catholic Church. If you go to church and, you know, swing, swing, swing the beads all over the place, hail Mary, come on, Mary, or come on, Mary, go, go, go. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you do what the Catholics say, it's a whole list of things you got to do to go to heaven. And that's not how, that's, that's not how you do it. You don't have a list at all. But many, many religions today are trying very hard to please God with their works. The Mormons, the, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Muslims. You got to do this, do this, do this, do this, and maybe God will accept you. All this is the, doing the same thing Cain did. God, look what I did for you. Look at my fruit and vegetables. God won't take it. You're only saved by grace through faith. Salvation has always been by God's grace through faith. Read Hebrews 11. By faith, Abraham pleased God. This is 2,000 years before Jesus came. God told him, Abraham, see the stars? You're going to have more kids than that. Lord, I'm 90. My wife is 80, but okay. He believed God, and God counted that to his account for righteousness. Read Hebrews 11. Okay, so I know we touched on this a few interviews back, but a lot of people wonder where do different skin colors and hair textures come from? I think it's obvious to anybody with one functioning eyeball and two brain cells that work that there are different skin colors of people on the world. There are different heights, different skin color, different hair color, different texture, different size nose, different eyes, et cetera. But there's really only one race called the human race. They're all one race. They're all interfertile. Here, are these different races of cows? No, no. It's cows. they're still cows. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Different skin colors. Okay. 450 not 50 recognized breeds of cows. Most of them would not survive in nature. You got to protect them on a farm and babysit them. Nothing about the cow has evolved. Breeders have selected a particular trait that they like, more milk or more beef or something, you know, heat resistance. Here's the world's record. This was the world's record. 185 pounds of milk every day. That's utterly insane. But they'll never get a cow to give 1,000 tons of milk a day. There's a limit, okay? There's the world's smallest cow in India, 20 inches tall, full grown. The world's biggest. 2,700 pound bull, but they find fossil bulls at 4,400 pounds. There are different skin colors on the cows, black, brown, brown. They all look the same in the meat locker. They all taste the same on the hamburger. So I, I would say there are, there's no such thing as different races of humans. There's not a black race and a white race. There are different skin colors. That's all. The pygmies, four foot tall. Some of them, some people have Chinese type facial skin, okay? I think most people agree the Cambodian, the Chinese, and the Japanese might have had a common ancestor. I wouldn't argue. The Suri, the Malaysian, the Australian, the New Guinean might have had a common ancestor. I, I don't argue with that. But they're still human. They're just, the people don't get it. They're still the same. They're still human. Uh, one theory is Adam and Eve were medium brown, and they produced all the colors in their own children. They've had some dark skinned people produce some light skinned babies. A lot. Okay. Second theory is the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. I don't believe that one at all. But they say the curse was Cain got dark skin. First of all, I don't think it's a curse to have dark skin, number one. Number two, uh, all of them died in the flood. 
Cocaine was, I don't, I don't believe that one. People have thought this is true and leading to horrible results, you know, through history persecuting dark skinned people. It's like the Mormon church teaches that the black skin is a curse from Cain. You can read the Mormon, official Mormon doctrine. I got it all right here. Uh, let's see. Uh, a whole bunch of stuff on Mormonism. What a crazy religion that is. Third theory is that Noah put a curse on Canaan. Now, this would be after the flood. Canaan was his grandson. He said, Canaan shall be a, a servant of servants, shall he be. Canaan shall be his servant. This is one of the sons of, uh, of Ham. Okay. No, I don't believe that one either. The third, the fourth theory is the Tower of Babel is what did it. At the Tower of Babel, a few hundred years after the flood, the people decided to make, you know, big tower to serve, because God had said, spread out. They said, we ain't doing it. We're sticking here together. So God divided them up by tongues, by families, by nations. Now you got small groups of people that all speak the same language. They go off their own direction. And if, you're, if there's inbreeding with a small group of people, you have unusual traits can become enhanced or stuck in the gene pool, like the Habsburg family. You had to marry royalty. Well, after a few generations, everybody started looking kind of strange. Okay? Here's the ostrich people of Africa. They have to marry in the family. Sometimes they got to marry sisters or aunts or nieces. They start looking kind of strange after a while. They call them the ostrich people. Read, read up on them for yourself. There's a family in uh, Kentucky, I believe, have to. So I think the nations were divided uh, after the flood. There's a good book about this after the flood. Japheth, Noah's son, had 14 kids and grandkids. It's a little tough to count and figure it out. Okay. Ham had 31 kids and grandkids. Okay. And the Bible talks about Egypt being the land of Ham. Egypt is the land of Ham. Hmm. So apparently, after the flood, they got off the ark. Ark landed right there in Turkey. Some people spread out this way, became the Orientals. Some people spread this way and became the Europeans. And some people came this way and became the Africans. So I think those would be the three major divisions if you want skin color to be a factor, would be the lighter skinned uh, Europeans, the darker skinned Africans, and the, they call them red, uh, yellow, Chinese or Shem. So I've never met a black man in my life, never. I've seen some dark brown ones, never met a black one, never met a white one. I'm not white, gee whiz, here. That's white. I'm not white. Okay. I'm Norwegian, pretty light skin. But uh, so I, I did find a picture of the darkest and lightest person they've ever found on earth. I thought I put it in here, but I've never met, never met a black man or a white man. So what about the giants in the land? Because the Bible says in that day, there were giants in the land. Where did giants go? Well, I think there have been lots of giant skeletons that have been found and pretty well-known secret that the Smithsonian will hide them in their basement. There's a theory that man started off like a chimpanzee and we're getting bigger, better, stronger, smarter. That's the evolution theory. And anything that goes against that religion, because actually it's a religion, has to be hidden. So if you could find evidence that man was much bigger and much smarter, well, you gotta hide that. because That goes against the theory of evolution. So I think there's overwhelming evidence. Uh, Sergio, are those books right over there under that window about the giants? Several books I have, many people have written on this topic about giants in the earth in those days. Uh, is it right here? The Nephilim, they're called. Of course, we have Goliath and his four brothers. They were all gigantic. Let's see, is it in here? Giants in the earth. Giant insects. Yeah, here we go. A couple of books. I get this stuff all the time. There's many people have written on this topic. Here we go. Ancient Giants of the Americas. This book's available, if you can see that one. Uh, giants on record. This is, shows the pictures of 12 and 14 and 15 foot skeletons that are found and they just suddenly disappear. But there've been lots and lots of reports of, I mean, giants. I got, here we go, giant insects. So I would say probably if you could kill one of them, you'd be a hero. Like David killed Goliath, you know. Six cubits in a span would be about 10 feet tall. The tallest person in living history was Robert Wadlow at eight foot 11 and a half from Alton, Illinois. When I was preaching in Alton, Illinois, some of the older ladies in the church said, oh yeah, we went to school with Robert. He was a real nice guy. He was real big, eight foot 11 and a half. Put him on the basketball team, throw the ball to Robert. Okay, drop it in right there, Robert. <laughs> so uh, I think that there's plenty of evidence of giants, you know, seven and eight feet tall. We got a guy living here at our camp at seven feet tall. They call him Big Will, drives the tractor. Used to be a bouncer in the bars in Monroeville. Boy, you, when he bounced you, you bounced, okay? Um, so 
I thought I had a bunch here. Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, I can't find it now. Watch my video series. I cover all this in great detail. And everything's referenced right at the bottom of the screen, where to find it. If you want okay. more information, all this is documented very well. You know, where they found it, what happened to it, disappeared into the basement. Let's see, giants have been found in all the different states where they've been found. California, you're in Colorado. Let me see what you got in Colorado, if any have been found there. Connecticut, Florida, they're not showing any. Uh, seven foot five, seven foot eight, nine foot two. Uh, massive wow, skull found in Florida. Big. There's another one from uh, nine foot two and Etowah, Cartersville, that'd be Georgia. Yeah, search giants on record. Okay, well, speaking of different beings, do you believe that there's life on other planets? Because you hear Christians and non Christians saying, we don't believe we're the only ones. Who are we to believe that we're the only ones? Do you believe that there's life on different planets? Why or why not? I get asked if there's intelligent life on other planets, and I say, no, I taught high school 15 years. There's not much intelligent life on this planet, okay? But no, the Bible says Eve is the mother of all living. That would close the case. Secondly, we'd have to have Jesus come to die. We'd have to die, we'd die again for them. God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. I do not think there's life on other planets. First of all, there is no evidence that there is. None. If you wish to imagine that, you can imagine anything you want, okay? But that's not science. So there's no credible scientific evidence to support the idea that there's life on other planets. None. Secondly, I think it would violate quite a few scriptures in the Bible. God made heaven and earth. This is it. He made earth to be inhabited. So this is it. Uh, and it would violate the, the, the death of Jesus Christ. It would cause him to have to go die again. I don't know. I think it would be some scriptural problems with that. But I hear people say, <laughs> but they could be different species that God didn't tell us about. Well, that's imagination. You can imagine whatever you want. Show me the evidence. Mm -hmm. You tell them, I said they're playing too many video games. Knock it off. Okay. And then there was uh, some chatter saying that NASA would hear different chatter from different parts of say the universe and they would hear it here in on planet earth. Tell them their head flows are not plugged in tight. That's what the chatter is coming from. Okay. So what Bible verses would you say would contradict this belief? Well, Eve is the mother of all living Genesis chapter three. God said, I'm going to, Adam said, I'm going to call her name Eve. She's the mother of everything. She's the mother of all living. Okay. So even animals? So that would be clear. Not the animals, no. All the uh -huh. people. And so okay. there's, the Earth is everything just right to support life. The right temperature, the right, right gravitational pull, the right atmospheric conditions, the right soil, water. There are so many things. It's called the Goldilocks zone. Earth has all those. We don't know of any other planets that do. None. So, and again, where's the evidence? There isn't any. You can make up a story all day long, uh, which they do. But I think it would violate the clear teaching of scripture that God so loved the world. This is it. It's, it's us. He wants us in his heaven. And I think the death on the cross is another is a big one. You'd have to, re, to figure out how, how you want to get that to fit in. You have to die again. Amen. Amen. So life was beautiful before Adam and Eve fell. And it seems as if life was still somewhat beautiful afterward as well. Do you oh, believe yeah. that in the end, we'll go back to life being beautiful like that? Do you believe that um, we'll have more oxygen? Do you believe that um, the fruit will be bigger? Do you believe that things will be like it was in the beginning? Well, I did a book on that. A book, I wrote a book on that called, Whoa, What on Earth is About to Happen? According to the Bible, uh, we're headed for a time of tribulation, which we might already be in. And then there's a time of God's wrath, <clears throat> and there's a thousand-year kingdom on earth called the millennium. Milli means thousand, like a millipede or a millimeter. Okay? Millennium. During that time, I think he's going to restore things like they were to, in the Garden of Eden conditions. Everybody will live to be a thousand. Uh, you live through the whole time. It's going to be beautiful. And then at the end of that, when he casts Satan into hell, into, I'm sorry, into the lake of fire, then the Bible says he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. I don't think our brain is even capable of thinking about what that's going to be like. If you tried to explain colors to a blind man, where would you start? Who knows? You can't. You're not going to get it. There's five ways you get stuff into your brain, through your eyes, the sense of sight, 
hearing, taste, touch, and smell. Those are the five senses. What if there's more? What if God just takes those five and expands them? Right now, you can see certain colors, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, the color spectrum. We know that the electromagnetic spectrum goes forever in both directions beyond that. What if we get to heaven and find out there's new colors? And you can see trillions of new colors, not new shades of these colors, new colors. See, that's why heaven has to be so large. It's for the women's closets. My wife's going to say, honey, does this go with this? I'm going to say, dear, I couldn't figure it out back on earth. Just pick it out and wear it. Okay, I don't care. What if you could smell the colors or hear them or taste them? We, our five senses are limited. They're, I enjoy them. They're pretty cool. But what if they're expanded where they overlap? Where you can smell the sounds. You go listen to a symphony play and you don't only hear them. You smell them and taste them. I wonder what middle C on the piano tastes like. I don't know. This is, again, imagine, imagination. But you ask the question. So I think we're going to get a new body that is going to be able to do and, and experience things we just can't even dream about right now. That's amazing. That's amazing. So Ken, if anyone would like to reach out to you, if they would like more information, because you've mentioned um, chapter two, three, four, five of your different books, how can they reach, reach you and how can they get their hands on it? All kinds of ways. We have a bunch of different channels listed on drdino.com, our website, uh, D-R-D-I-N-O. Let me get that up here. I got somewhere. That's the best way to get you know, our phone number is 855 big dino, like a dinosaur. 855 big dino. I'll put them all up on screen here. There we go. <clears throat> can you make mine larger there so they can read it? Huh? Oh, it's on the okay. Drdino.com, 855 big dino. Come visit us in Lenox, Alabama. We're straight north of Pensacola, 70 miles, middle of no place, little bitty town, Lenox, Alabama, and it's wonderful here. Come spend a couple of days. We have cabins you can stay in, 17 lakes for fishing. It's an amazing, but it's all free. Never charge anything. Our science center, 12,000 square feet. We do have to warn you though about the water. We have well water and I taught biology 15 years. And if you drink well water, your babies will be born naked. So just be aware of that. And my wife, I keep telling her, honey, don't serve tea. She continually serves tea for lunch. Did I warn you about how dangerous tea is? No, how dangerous is tea? There was an Indian one time that drank four gallons of iced tea. That night, he drowned in his teepee. <laughs> Kent, oh my goodness. <laughs> I taught high school 15 years. I'm sorry, it messed me up, okay? We're on, face, we're on Facebook and YouTube and TikTok and a whole bunch of places. They're all listed, our channels on drdino.com. All right, drdino.com, all right. And would you end this out in prayer? Would you pray for everyone watching right now? Because um, I'm sure a lot of people had their questions answered. Uh, today with the information that uh, you had given us. So could you just pray for our audience right now? Sure, let's pray. Heavenly Father, there's probably somebody listening right now that's not even one of your children. They've never asked you to forgive them and come into their heart. I pray that right now today, they will surrender and ask you to forgive their sin and move in to receive you as their savior. Move in, Lord. Ask them to get them to ask you to come in and forgive their sin. <clears throat> Make this their birthday into your family. Lord, there might be some Christians here listening to this channel that have lost their faith or need their faith to be strengthened. I pray that they'll read your word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Help them to get back in the book and read it. And Lord, there's probably some Christians here that have never led anybody else to you. They've never led one soul to Christ. I pray that they'll get busy and find something to do for your kingdom and draw other people into it, Lord. Please use our little ministry to reach millions worldwide, we ask now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Kent Amen. Hoban, once again, thank you so much for being on Deep Believer. Thank you, ma'am. Come back anytime. If you'd like to be born again and give your life to Jesus Christ today, pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner and am lost without you. I'm convinced that you're my only saving grace and my only hope. No longer do I want to do life without you. I believe that you came to earth to die on the cross for my sins, rose from the dead three days later, and are coming back for me one day soon. Please come into my heart and be my Lord, Savior, and friend. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. If you've prayed that prayer, get yourself a Bible and read it daily and ask God to interpret every word for you. Then surround yourself with like-minded believers in Jesus Christ. Congratulations and welcome to the family.